throughout these videos, I try my best to make you laugh, try my best to make you happy. In this crazy world with everything that's going on right now, one of the best places to be and one of the most peaceful places, places to be and the most unifying places to be is the kitchen. All right. It's the Carolina it's cook, the Carolina cook, and the Carolinas, 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 Carolinas. What's up, y'all? Chef Anthony L. Britton, the Carolina cook, cooking the Carolinas here. So in this episode, episode 20, I will be making beef riet, uh, mushroom pate, um, whole grain mustard from scratch. I'm trying to find it on the paper. Why well, can't I ever get this stuff right, man? <laughs> not a chef. If you're not cooking something that you can't pronounce. <laughs> the reason I'm making these funny things is because I will be making crackers from scratch. And these are basically, so these are basically like finger food ingredients that you spread over crackers. Simple finger food. Hors d'oeuvres. Hors d'oeuvres. Hors d'oeuvres. You can, even when you're serving it, just make people think that you just all up here with it. Like, hors d'oeuvres. Make sure you brush your teeth first, though. You don't want that hors d'oeuvres to be hot. <laughs> see, you know I'm not up here with it because I can't even <laughs> roll it off of the tongue like that. Hard d'oeuvres. But in this episode, that's what I'll be cooking, y'all. So, let's get it popping. Okay, y'all, real quick, I'm going to show y'all how to make something real simple. We're going to make some mustard. So here I got some mustard seeds. Pour those mustard seeds into this container. May as well pour all of it in there. Apple cider vinegar. And some water. And what we're going to do is let that soak overnight. And I'll be back tomorrow with the completion of the process. Good night, Moon. All right, y'all, as promised, the continuation on the mustard making process, okay? I'm gonna try to use this little uh, food blender processor thing and hope that it's able to grind this mustard seed. If not, I'm gonna have to move to the blender. Now, we're making a coarse mustard, not a smooth mustard. So, we wanna take about a half cup of this uh, these seeds out. All right, you want to reserve part of these seeds because you want a coarse mustard. So you're going to reserve some of these seeds. The rest is going into the blender. Now, I'm going to add some brown sugar to this. And I'm going to add a little salt. Now, let's make some mustard. What you did was impulsive, capricious, and melodramatic, but it was also wrong. Yeah, I was wrong for that. It's now transferred to a blender. Now, let's see if I have a little more success this time. That little food chopper, grater, process, or whatever that thing is, was just... Okay, the blender doing something. So we're going to post these soup seeds into the mustard consistency. But the blender did it, y'all. There you have it.
mustard. Now what you want to do, since I'm going for a coarse mustard, to spread on my uh, crackers and pate and all of that, we're going to add these seeds that we have reserved into the mustard. All right, y'all, now that we got the reserved portion of mustard inside of this blender, we're going to just pulse it a little bit just to get a, a coarse mustard. Pulse it just a little bit. I'm going to add this mustard to this mason jar. I'm going to, it's going to take another day on this mustard, y'all. So I'll come back tomorrow and make the crackers. Good night, Elizabeth. Good night, John boys. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Jim Bob. What's going on? I was asleep. What's everybody doing? Good night, Good night Jim Bob. Bob. All right, y'all, this is my mustard the next day. I'm gonna go ahead and let it sit overnight. I mean, I let it sit overnight or whatever. Like I said, the longer you leave it out, the uh, stronger it will get. So then it done sat and thickened up a little bit. I probably could have put less liquid in it, but uh, it is what it is. Now I'm gonna go ahead and refrigerate it. All right, y'all. Okay, y'all, it's a little late in the evening, but I'm going to be making a riyet. A riyet you make out of white meat, like pork, rabbit, turkey, chicken. And certain fish but, um, and, in this and case, game to do some beef. It's a slow cooking process where you cook the meat really tender. Slow and low until it's really tender. The ingredients are one pound of pork butt, but I'm using beef. So... I'll be using 1.38 pound, 1.38 pound sirloin steak, which is this. And you're gonna need two tablespoons of duck fat, bacon, lard, butter, vegetable oil, canola oil. I'm gonna be using I'm gonna be using Crisco vegetable shortening. Um, try to keep it a little bit healthier than just use a straight out fat. You're gonna need one each onion. So really an onion cut in half. I'll be using one half of that onion. You're gonna need two cloves. Cloves are something like Cinnamon, nutmeg, somewhere in that arena, as far as the uh, flavor profile and the aroma and stuff like that goes. Um, so that's basically what they look like right there. <laughs> Two of those. Look like little miniature stems apple stems or so gonna need you're gonna need two bay leaves all right you're gonna need a thyme sprig that's one thing i need to add to my herb garden i don't have any thyme sprigs i don't have any thyme so if you don't have a time spray, just use about one fourth teaspoon dried thyme. And you want about a quarter teaspoon of salt. The salt I'm using is kosher salt. They're large crystals. You look at those crystals, they're fairly large. All right. Then you're going to need water as needed. You want to cut these into large dice. All right. 
chop, chop, chop. I chew no flip. They say chop, chop, chop. I chew no flip. What you get? Chop, chop, chop. chop. Now that everything's prepped up, ready to go, we're going straight to the pot. Make sure you can, you use a good pot that can handle, handle this. Get that fat nice and melted. All right, once that fat is melted, you want to brown and caramelize the beef on one side. Then you repeat that process on the other side. All right, once you get a good caramelization going, ooh, that's beautiful. Flip them over. I'm going to repeat that process on the other side, then we'll be ready to put our flavors in the pot. And as you can see, the beef is also rendering its own fat as well. But this process takes anywhere from three to six hours. It depends on the size of the meat that you're using and the type of meat that, you, that you're using. That's why this is more ideal for white meats. So I'm taking a risk here by using red meat because it may take a longer period of time. But these cuts are not that big. It, it shouldn't take that long. All right, now let's turn this heat down a little bit. Cause you want to cook this slow and low on top of the stove or in the oven. See how that looking in there? Now, you stick your cloves in your onions so you don't have to try to pick these cloves out later. Why does it look like this onion looking at you? <laughs> Put your bay leaves in there. Put your thyme in there. Your thyme sprig or your dry thyme. Whatever type you use. And put all of your salt in there. Yeah. Basically, gonna let that go for a couple hours until you get the uh, consistency that you're looking for. You want it real, really, really soft so that you can shred it like, like pulled pork. And it's going to be like a tuna salad type or a chicken salad type consistency. When you There's really no time frame on it because you're cooking for a texture on how soft you can get it. I just want to show y'all what this smelling like. Can y'all see that smell right there? Since you can't smell it. <laughs> All right, like I said, let that go for a few hours until, until this meat is tender. All right, now that I done let the flavor sweat out a little bit on their own, I'm adding water to it now. Put your water in there and let it cook. One eternity later. All right, y'all, I think this re is to my desired consistency. Now, what we're going to do is strain it. And once we strain it, we want to pull that onion out that had the cloves in it as well. Pull that bay leaf out. Then you want to press it. Get all of that extra juice. Press it. You want to press it. Get that extra juice out of there. And you can see how tender that meat is right there. All right, I'm going to go back through it to make sure that I got all the onions and everything out. You can see that meat starting to shred. And you want to reserve this juice. You want to reserve this juice. I'll tell you why in a minute. And you'll see the fat from that meat. All of that's going to come to the surface of that juice. All right. Now let's take our forks. And shred this meat as fine as we possibly can. You see how that's coming apart? And by the, time, by the way, my cook time for this meat. Like I said, is no particular time on this meat. You just cooking until it gets very tender, slow and low, 
until it gets very tender. Then you want to pull it like pulled pork. And the reason we reserve this fat and liquid is because to get uh, like a spreadable consistency, because we're doing finger foods and you want to be able to like spread this on crackers. Um, we're going to be adding some of the liquid and fat to this. You don't want it too juicy, but you don't want it too, too dry. You want to get it like a, like a spread, like a, uh, like a chicken spread or a tuna spread for crackers. <laughs> My lights just flashed on and back off for some reason. I don't know why. All right. Now you can see that the fat, you can see that clear layer of fat that has formed up top. Now what you want to do, pull the spoon at an angle, skim that fat off like so, and just pour it into your mixture. And you trying to change that texture to the point where it's spreadable. If you get a little bit of the cooking liquid, that's fine. Because you want you want it to start sticking together. To become spreadable. The ingredients for the mushroom pate is on the screen. I like that. I need to do my videos like that from now oh. on. It saves a lot of time. Now let's get this mushroom pate going. So out of your three tablespoons of olive oil, you want two tablespoons in your pan. All right, two tablespoons, and you're gonna leave one tablespoon to the side for later use. Okay, add your butter. And you're gonna cook your garlic and your shallots for about five minutes until soft. Said I'm using red onion and take it off that heat. I got a little brown going on there. Add that red pepper, add your mushrooms. I would say they look nice and evaporated. Then you want to add the sherry. which in this case is white wine vinegar. And you add salt and pepper to it. Razzle dazzle it with salt and pepper. Razzle dazzle. All right, after you get a little evaporation going, just remove them from the heat and let them cool down completely. All right, now that everything's cool, Handle to that darn pot wasn't cool. You added these mushrooms to the blender. We adding that parsley. And we're gonna pulse it until it's finally chopped. gonna pulse that cream, cream cheese in there until it's incorporated. Your finished pate. Mushroom pate. I didn't want to go through all of that of uh that long process of doing it with chicken livers, but you could do with do this with chicken livers or whatever you Decide you want to make a pate out of. I chose mushrooms instead of a chicken liver because it's a shorter process and a more instant process. 
<clears throat> All right, y'all, I'm finally getting on the last leg of this uh, recipe that I'm putting together for y'all, <clears throat> for y'all, for finger food. Um, this is the cracker portion. A couple days have gone by now. All right, but this is the last scratch right here for me to make these crackers. Spread and stuff like that has already been made. Mustard, all of that, as y'all know already. But the way you make crackers, the ingredients for making the crackers will be three cups of all-purpose flour. I don't plan on making that many crackers, so I'm going with two cups. Two teaspoons of sugar. Two and a half teaspoons of salt. I'm using kosher salt. And for your fat, you want four tablespoons of uh, olive oil or melted butter. I'm using extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin. That means this bottle of olive oil has never touched another bottle of olive oil before. This olive oil kept itself pure. No, that's not what that actually means. I'm waiting on marriage, Popeye. Um, <laughs> of water. And then you're going to need... So that's, that's the olive oil uh, measured out, but... You keep the bottle on hand because you're going to also use olive oil as needed. Because you're going to have to brush the top of the crackers and everything after after they're made. All right, y'all. Several hours have went past. I have had a long and eventful day. But we're going to get to making these crackers. It's like 10-something at night now. And I got to get up in the morning and get some things done. But you want to... Add your flour. All right, now my darn arm getting tired. These little lumps don't want to go away. Then you want to add your salt. I want to make sure it's not clumped together. That's all. Same with my sugar. So that's your flour and your sugar and your salt. You want to combine the dry ingredients. And y'all, I'm going to add some oregano. Because when you're making your own crackers or whatever, you can pretty much make whatever flavor variations and adjustments, modifications that you want to. Every recipe has room to be tweaked, all right? Now, I forgot to tell y'all, line a pan with parchment paper. I don't have parchment paper, so I'm using wax paper. It is what it is. We'll see how it turns out. I've done it before in a lot of baked items. And you want to preheat your oven to 450 degrees while, while you're getting everything together. All right, now what you want to do is incorporate the fat. In my case, I'm using olive oil as the fat. And you want to incorporate that throughout the flour. This is where your flakiness and everything comes from right here. Incorporating that f fat in there. Then you want to gradually add water. Gradually. You don't want to overdo it. Then when it gets nice and tacky, see how it's starting to turn tacky? Then it'll be time to, to roll it. I'm going to spare y'all this process. I'll get back with y'all. Once this dough is formed, I'm 
want to cut it in half. <laughs> cut that dough in half. And you want to form it into a rectangular shape. That's about close to a rectangle as I'ma get, bro. Alright, now once your dough is rolled out, what you want to do is brush it lightly with olive oil. Okay. Hey, y'all see them herbs and stuff? That basil that spread out into that cracker? That's gonna give it some good taste. Now you're supposed to use the other half of your cracker. Uh, mixture dough mixture to make another batch of crackers but I'm only going with one then you want to stab the mixture with a fork well not necessarily stab but you want to poke holes throughout the mixture with a fork that's why you see uh, holes in your crackers because those holes help keep the cracker flat while the while the cracker is baking Okay, y'all. Well, that's the other side up out there. But what you want to basically do now is cut this dough into squares. All right, y'all, these are my crackers. I cut them as consistently as I possibly could. Some of the cuts are a little bit different and a little bit odd, but that's okay. I'm going to bake them up. Like I said, you preheat the oven to uh, 450. A lot of times when you let people know something made from scratch, they automatically know that. It's not going to be like a always perfect appearance, like as if something was made from a machine uh, with perfect machine cuts. Even though I could have took my time to do this a little better. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, y'all, these are our finished crackers. See that? And yes, I got rid of the ugly ones, okay? And when you take them out of the oven, you're basically baking them at like four, 400 full. Yeah, about 400 for about 15 minutes or until golden brown. You're going to see the outer edges of the crackers begin to crisp and cook before the inside of the cracker. And uh, so you want to keep an eye on them. When they're golden brown, that's when you know they're right. Then you uh, want to cool them on a cooling rack, and as they cool, they'll begin to crisp as they cool. So you got yourself a nice crisp cracker here. All right, y'all. I got my homemade mustard, whole grain mustard there. I'm going to spread some of this pate on one cracker that I got mustard on. It's a little weird. And I'm going to put some some of this beef on one cracker. Okay. There you have it. Okay, y'all, to sum everything up real quickly, the mushroom pate is an acquired taste. It's very mushroomy, <laughs> to say the least. With the rillette, it's basically a preserved meat that people put a lot of fat in to uh, preserve it. They'll even put a big layer of fat on top to make it last longer. Um, but as you can see, I did not mix a ton of fat in mine. The fat makes it spreadable and all of that and acts as a preservative as well. Um, and with the 
mustard. I'm not a big fan of mustard, but most people, that's what they dip their crackers and pretzels in. So a lot of people look at this be like, this is not black food, black people food. You may be correct. It's not what a lot of us are accustomed to, but with us, we'll probably just take some crackers, spread some peanut butter on it, and throw some cheese on it, call it a day. But, you know, when you when you enter the culinary world, your your palate and, and your cooking skills and all that expand. But with all that being said, I hope y'all enjoyed. Like, share, like, share the love and subscribe. And like it, sheriff, and subscribeth thou unto my channel.